Okay, well, thank you. So thank you very much for the introduction. I'm honored to be here. I was trying to think what an open lecture was, and um, I decided to go for a very soft start uh, introduction to hashing, and some of you will uh, hopefully at least find mildly entertaining. And then I will switch gears after 10, 15 minutes, and uh, then we'll see what happens. Uh, but for now, just something about hashing and how you can sort of try to explain it to people. Um, so assume we are trying to distribute some objects and some boxes. We're trying to make a system for that. And we may think, well, there's some, we certainly want to make place for the animals, so let's put all the animals in box one. But we don't know what's coming. So how should we make such a system? So the idea is to use the wheel of fortune, right? So we want to place the rabbit. We spin the wheel. It puts it in, suggests 10, so we put it there. Continue with the kitten. It suggests four, and now we take the stable. And it goes to two. One, sorry, you have to wait. It's always a little interesting what happens. And you can continue this way. And the nice thing we get out of just placing things randomly is at least we don't expect to overfill any boxes. So it's not like it's perfectly placed. We have nothing in two. And we have three and six. But there's not a huge crowding anywhere as there would have been if we had lots of animals and decided to put them all in box number one. <coughs> so for now, that's good. But really, when we have these systems, we want to be able to find things, right? We want to know where did we put Wally. And so the way we want to approach this, the simple way is just to spin the wheel of fortune. It says four, and of course, Wally is there. That's sort of the dream, right? Uh, and let's look at a real system instead of these small systems, because you know I'm interested in real systems. So let's take how complicated the real world can be, right? So again, the challenge is to find Wally. And you just want to spin the wheel of fortune. and. There he is. So I needed to do this because my eyes are not that good anymore. But anyhow, there he is. So that's what we want, right? So this is a fully random hash function I've tried to describe. So we want a recomputable function that assigns independent random values to every possible object in the universe, right? So you get the rabbit gets one number, Wally gets another number. And the nice properties is that because the numbers were between 1 and 12, the probability to get the same number is 1 12. And with 18 other objects, we expect that Wally gets together with one and a half other objects. OK. So let's put the numbers aside. And so the essential thing here is we want it to be recomputable. So if we spin the wheels again, we want to get the same values. Right. And so this is where things become impossible, or not really impossible. But we simply, the only way we can do this is by remembering all the different numbers. But we're trying to design a system to store things, now we just have to store the numbers as well. That just makes things, things far worse. Right. So what can we do? So we want a recomputable random hash function, now no longer say fully random. And so the point is that on computers, things have numbers. They're all only three-digit numbers. And now we just pick two of these three-digit numbers below a certain prime. And then we create this mathematical formula based on these two numbers that tell us where everything goes, because we just have to plug it into the formula. Right, and the only thing, if we just make sure that the first number is not different from zero, then the probability that they get the same hash value is 1 12, which is exactly what we're hoping for. OK, so now we know how to create a storage system. We just pick two random numbers. And now we have our formula. We plug, things, plug the different things in and find out where they go. So this system has a certain weakness, because we really would be very concerned if some devil like that turned up and saw the numbers that we're dealing with. right? Because if he saw that, then he could figure out that he should just put in the cow, which is 422. And then the cow goes up and hides Wally. And the whole point was we wanted to be able to find Wally again. Right? And he can continue this way. And up comes a bomb. And the whole system blows up. Right. And the problem here is, again, that he saw these random choices. And that's sort of the vulnerability in all these kind of randomized systems we have. We sort of assume that nobody from outside can see what's going on inside. And that's also why a lot of security relies on these kind of secrets in random systems. So 
Again, when we work with these randomized algorithms, we we'll often assume we have these wonderful fully random hash functions, and the only problem is that they don't exist. But often it suffices with something more limited that we actually can guarantee, like what we saw before was low collision probability. There was t different hash values, the probability that two things get the same value as one over t. And that's used for storing and finding objects in computer memory, signatures, and many other things. And so the interesting question is what other kind of probabilistic guarantees are we actually able to get with these hash functions since we can't do the perfect thing. And another very nice one is fair minwise hashing. So that is that given any set of objects, each object has basically the same probability of getting the smallest hash value. And that's used in all kinds of things in, within big data, classification, of web pages, and all this kind of stuff. And just to show it in action, right? So we want to find out who has similar taste. This could be used in a recommendation system. And what we do is just to say, well, it's probably the guys who have the same smallest hash values. And at first, when you see this, if you haven't seen it before, you say, well, why, right? But then you try, and you run an experiment, and we see that Peter and Lars have the same smallest hash value. And in fact, they do have all more films in common, right? Uh, and of course, if it was just these small examples, we could do it by hand, but you could do the same thing for books, associate hash values with every word, and see if the two books have the same smallest hash value. And so mathematically speaking, again, for any two sets, what we use is the probability that they get the same smallest hash value is exactly the size of the intersection divided by the size of the union. And but that is only assuming fair minwise hashing, where every element of the union has exactly the same chance of getting the smallest hash value. Otherwise, this equation is not true. Right. But assuming we have it, then we could just repeat a few with a few of these fair hash functions to get a good signature for the book or whatever it is, so we can see if two books have some similar vocabulary. Unfortunately, bias is impossible, and it's impossible in the same way as we don't have fully random hash functions. You basically need an enormous description. Uh, but we can get very small bias, and that's one of the things I want to talk about. Uh, but just sort of, again, as Dick mentioned, I have been doing a lot of this stuff in the real world, and just what happens with the similarity estimation, right? So here is actually I ran this thing with minwise hashing, where I did a number of different experiments and looked at the mean and saw how it developed. And it converges beautifully. So it looked great, the experiment. There's only one detail, that is the truth was down here. Okay, and that's a kind of problems you have when you don't use proper hash functions. And this is with real data. That's actually comparing arithmetic sequence against the random number. And just that was enough to mess up with a simple hash function like the one we saw before. Uh, but again, this is good to know because when you sit there, often what you have is the estimates, the real data disappeared. Maybe you're trying to find out why you had an overloaded link somewhere, something like that. And uh, you know, the traffic is long gone, so you can't go back and find out. You'll just be working with the wrong information. And then the same uh, data, but with a proper hash function, a proper use of it, so it's also better use, which has better convergence. It converges to the right value, and the good thing is, and when you do it the right way, I can guarantee that things will always converge to the right value and not some thing like this thing here. Okay. So a short break, very short. I am going to switch to LaTeX because I can't really do math with uh, 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 this thing here. So. And then he said, just believe. OK. So more. So what I'm now going to talk about is how you can actually achieve some of this power using tabulation, which is something I've worked on a lot in recent years. Here are some of the papers I'm going to mention things from. But basically, the whole point is that hashing, I think, is so beautiful. You have these ideas like minwise hashing and stuff like that. And we have convinced the rest of the world to use it, especially in big data, all kinds of signatures, stuff like that. But can we actually implement these hash functions? Are there some simple ones that can actually do the job for us? So again, the target is some simple and reliable pseudo-random hashing that provides algorithmically important probabilistic guarantees similar to those of truly random hashing. So we see that as the big goal. I mean, sometimes we might actually be able to do something even better, but for now, I'm just trying to be as good as fully random, and yet which are easy to implement. So this kind of thing of bridging theory with the true randomness was something that can actually be done. And I think this program is very crucial because randomized algorithms are very simple and popular. So they're being used everywhere, where, right? Quicksort, all kinds of things people use. So they're out there, they're being used, 
but often people don't do use strong enough hash functions. Uh, basically, since we don't tell them what to do, they ask their neighbor, they may go to Dr. Dobbs journal, and somebody in Dr. Jobs journal say this is a fantastic hash function or whatever, and it's just because it happened to work for his applications, but maybe his applications weren't that demanding. If he was just using it for hash tables and stuff like that, anything would do, almost anything would do. But if he wanted to use for minwise hashing, that's a completely different challenge. And we can go on like that, right? So, and it's really not nice if you want to design a system for, say, f um, what they call it, helping flights fly around to say, well, this hash function used in some other context, hopefully it use, can be used here. You need to know when you can trust systems. And the biggest problem in some sense is that two simple hash functions may work deceivingly well in random tests because everything works in random tests. It's not until you get hit by the real structures of real life that you discover you have a problem, and that may be too late. So again, uh, hashing. Just, we did it before with rabbits and kittens and stuff like that. Let me now do it more boringly. So again, a hash function here is just illustrated by a funny curly thing. It's sort of out of control. And so when I want to store X in my hash table, when it's chaining, I just go to the hash, to the list that is pointed out by a, the hash function of X and see if it is in that list. And if not, I just add it to the list, to the chain. Then we have the other classic linear probing where we hash into an open array. We see if X is at that location. If not, we go to the next location, next location, until we either find X or find an empty location. If we do that, we know X was not in. That's where we put it. We have cuckoo hashing where you have two arrays, and we, get, we have two independent hash functions that gives two different places. And if X is in this cuckoo hashing table, then it should be in one of these two places. Okay, it's not there, so we want to put it in, but now things get complicated. But we can, want, we can try to put it in where W was, but W also had two different hash locations. So then we have to see if W can put it, be put in its other location. It can't, but then we move that, and we continue around until we find an empty place, and then we swap everything around. So again, Google hashing is great when it's just searching, but the updates are fairly complicated. All kinds of other applications, uh, second moment estimation, don't want to talk about that. But I'm going to return to this minwise hashing we had before, which again is used to decide if uh, two sets are similar. And again, the property we want here is that for any given element, for any element in any set, the probability that it gets the smallest hash value is one divided by the set size and then plus minus some bias that is hopefully really small. And again, actually, if you use these hash functions I talked about before, the bias is of logarithmic size, so that's multiplicative. So the epsilon is not at all, not even a constant. It's far beyond that. So you need to be very careful what you do. Okay, so the classic approach to these things is Kahn and Wegman's K independence, which says that, well, we can't have truly random hashing, but we can have it be K independent, which means that all keys hash uniformly into the range of hash values. And when we look at k different keys, they hash independently. But only k, not everything. And that has this classic implementation, which is just the degree k minus 1 polynomial with k random coefficients. And we can sometimes do a little bit better, but it really starts getting slow, I would say, when k is bigger than 5 or something like that. Then I don't really know how to do anything efficient. But it's still a beautiful paradigm, because we can take any application we have, and we can ask, how much independence does it take to make it work? So with chaining, we just saw that we need independence too. But if we want to have the property that we don't get more than log n divided by log log n element in any bucket, then we need that much independence. There's some ways around it. But say linear probing that I talked about, which is far more useful in practice, actually needs five independent hashing. So often people just, in practice, try to use two independent hashing, but then trouble can happen, as I'll get back to. I have two estimation, you need four independence. And with minwise independence, the interesting thing is that to get uh, as sub-constant independ uh, bias, you need a super-constant independence. Okay, so there's no constant independence that really suffices here. You need to use these higher independence. So the question is really, is this the right way of attacking things? And I started with Mihai uh, looking at this simple tabulation hatch hashing that's also called Sobrist hashing that goes back to chess computers. And I'm going to tell about why it's related to chess computers in a bit. But basically, we just take a key and divide it into characters. And I'm thinking of it as a constant number of characters. So think a 32-bit key is just being divided into four 8-bit characters. And for each character, we have a truly random hash table mapping all the characters. 
and then what we do to compute the hash of a key is just to look up each character in its table and XOR all the results. So this is super fast if these tables are small, and they are. I mean, if you think of 8-bit characters, they only have 256 entries, so they fit in the fastest cache. Okay, and we just have to lo do C lookups. So this is very feasible because we're, again, dealing with very small tables. We can't have random hash values for every single thing in the universe. I mean, it could be a size 2 to 64. That would be way too big, but we can easily have uh, random, store random things for every single character because there are not too many of these. Okay, so the basic point is that this is actually, just if you look at, um, this is three independent, this scheme, and it's actually much faster than using the polynomial method, which just needed a degree two polynomial. It's almost three times as fast. It uh, has a speed like just two regular multiplications. But it's not four independent. It's very easy to see because if you just look at, of keys that consist of two characters, all the combinations of two characters in two positions, and you take the hash of all of them, then they will always get zero. So if you know the hash of three of them, you always know the hash of the fourth one, which also means it's terrible from a crypto perspective. Okay, so back to our independence. The cool thing is that even though this is not even four independent, four depend that it's not even for independent, it works for all of these things in one shot. So this makes it very easy. It's very easy to implement, and all these applications just work with this thing here. And especially, the, I mean, for linear probing, it's much faster. And if we take these schemes here, it would be, you know, you would spend a logarithmic time just computing the hash value, and then you could write as well use a binary search tree. So having this scheme is much better. So Knuth actually recommends a scheme, but he cites only the three independent as mathematical quality. So we want to prove that it works, which means that for worst, for worst case input, so we have to prove that this dependence cannot come and hurt us, right? So we know every time we have four keys, we could have dependence, and yet we have to show that this is not a problem. Here comes a very ugly theorem to look at. Uh, I think some of you are familiar with it, but let me just try to go through it slowly. So I assume I have n balls that I throw into n bins, and that there are, you know, there are not much fewer uh, bins than there are balls. Okay, so there could be fewer. Uh, and I do it with simple tabulation. And then I have a special ball, the query ball, that I throw somewhere, because the point is when I come with a key, I want to know how many guys did I end up with. Okay, so we both have a query ball, which is the one we throw that's special, and we ask how many came together with him. And then we count how many other guys it is that land with him. Then we have mu for the expected number, which is n divided by m. And then we get these um, error probability bounds. So what's the probability that we get 1 plus delta mu to bigger value? And these are the classic Chernoff bounds you know. The only difference between these, and if we had full randomness, is that if we had full randomness, we didn't need the omega, and we needed, didn't need the m to the minus gamma. So the omega just means that things happen a bit slower, so we have to go a bit further out in the, uh, a constant factor further out in the tail to get the same uh, low probability. So the effect is just a bit slower, but it happens, but it's only by a constant factor. And the other factor here is basically, well, if m is large, we could say that this is a very small probability. Right. So this sort of like saying that this first part here worked with high probability. Can I ask a quick question? Yes? What is that in the numerator? I can't, my glasses are bad or something. Oh, this gamma here? No, yeah, the, no, the, there in the equation, go to the left, just the e to the delta, is that an e or is that a... That's e, that's just the base of the natural log, okay. e to the delta. So, yeah, it's just the classic Chernoff bound, uh, just with two differences. I mean, they're important, but only two differences, this constant here, and uh, this m to the minus gamma. This is then the tabulation method, right? That's when I use simple tabulation to throw the balls. So how do you define if you have m balls, so what's the size of the small tables? You told us about 32 bits, you break them in four characters. Yes. Um, so this has nothing to do with the table. So that I'm saying I implement. I throw the balls using simple tabulation hashing, which okay. means I define a, a, a table for each character, and I use that to define the hash value. And now I just throw the balls, 
and uh, and see where they land and see how many lands together with a given guy. And I'm claiming we get something very similar to what we know that if we had full randomness. But if you say only used polynomial hashing or only used k independence for some constant, you would only have a polynomial tail bound. You wouldn't have this exponential decay that we like to have and like to think we have when we have full randomness. The thing we use is statistics and stuff. Okay. So this has nothing to do with the key size. Uh, this is just if I use this hashing scheme in this context. So all I require is that the key are only divided into a constant number of characters. Yeah. Okay. That was okay. That was one minute. Okay. So that's the only requirement. Yes. Does that uh, gamma depend on the constant or? The yes. So the gamma is shoveled in here. Yes. In the constant, so gamma has to be a constant. So for every constant gamma, yeah. this is a constant. Exactly. And yes, I didn't write it. It's not that bad, but I didn't write it. Yes. Is that the same constant as the C of them? As the C, well, both C and gamma affects this constant. But again, my experience is actually that it's best to work with 16-bit uh, characters. That runs fast on modern computers. And then the constant is the C is a two. So even two to the two is not so bad. So uh, I mean, these are not horrible things. So I mean, I'm just claiming that. But it would be horrible to look at if I put it in. OK, but it's not horrible. So and I'm actually going to prove something. I know that's uh, normally advised again, but I'm going to give a simple proof. Uh, I'm just going to show that if we have hash n keys into n to 1 plus omega 1 bins, then all bins get only a constant number of bin balls with high probability. And the reason why this is interesting is that nothing like that would hold if we just had k independence for some constant. Okay, so we are having uh, we are having polynomially more bins than we have balls, but it could just be 1.1 into 1.1 or something like that. Okay, so the first part here is ugly, but so the key observation here is that if we have any set T of balls. Then there's or of keys. Then there is a subset of logarithmic size that hash completely independently, and this is really one of the key observation connection with uh, uh, tabulation hashing. And this is very easy to see because you say let i be a character position where they differ, any where the keys and t differ, and then just take the least common character in that position, and pick any key that has a as a character in that position, <coughs> right? And now we throw away all other keys from T that uses uh, the character A in position I. Okay, so now we have now we have only one key in the system left that has A in character I, and that's X. No one else. Okay. And so the point is that then ha the hash of X is independent of everybody else because it's the only one that depends on the random hash value associated with A in position I. Okay. And now. What we basically do is just to recurse on U prime, which is just defined recursively, right? Because we took the least common character in that position, which means that we took out at most half the keys, and now we recurse on the rest. Okay? So this means that we are guaranteed to have a logarithmic number of keys pulled out this way, and they all hash completely independently. Okay, so that was the first claim, and the next one is just that there <coughs> cannot exist a set of whatever number of keys it is that all hash independently to the same bin. Again, a very simple argument. There are not that many different sets, and if one of these sets hash independently, because that's what they should do here, then the probability that they land in the same bin is very small, and then we just uh, do a un we just multiply the numbers using a union bound and conclude that the probability of this bad event that we had these keys that hashed independently that they all land in the same bin is m2 minus gamma. Okay, so it's just playing with numbers, but the critical point here is that with simple separation, even though it's only three independent, but inside any set T which is of super constant size, there's a subset that is also of super constant size where all the keys hash independently. And then that's really the key. And, and you can't get the statement better than that, because if you just think of, a, of the keys as being 0, 1 vectors, then, uh, well, then there aren't that many, there's not that much randomness in the system, because we, in each character position, only use two random hash values. So we can't hope for more independence than what we're getting this way. So this is really the best argument you could hope for. And this is also 
the difference. But if you only have very few characters, then again, you will get a large set. OK, so in fact, so this thing suffices to, I mean, when we had the channel found, that suffices to show that both uh, linear probing and, uh, and chaining works very well. And in fact, cuckoo hashing can also be proved to work well, but that is a lot more complicated. And the fundamental point is that we get obstructions just by looking at a small number of keys. If you have three keys that hash to the same two hash values, then there's no way of uh, resolving things for the sake of cuckoo hashing. So you did not have that problem with things like linear probing and chaining and stuff like that. If you have a small constant size problem, things will just even out at other places. It's not a big deal. But here, you need something far more delicate. So what I claimed was that this is sort of fast and practical and stuff like that, but I actually ran some experiments together with uh, Yin Chang. And sort of the critical thing here is just to say this is simple tabulation here. right? And if you try to compare that with, say, the degree five polynomial type schemes, you'll see it's actually significantly faster. So it's about a factor 10. It's also much, much simpler to implement. Simple tabulation is, uh, I guess, a couple of lines of code, basically, whereas if you want to impl implement these polynomials, you have to implement long multiplications and all this kind of stuff, which is also why things are slow. This is a funny way of using tabulation to implement five independent, sort of, sort of like an inbreed between these two different things, but I'm just focused on this line here. You can also see the difference between, this is an old 32-bit computer and this is a 64-bit computer. The difference are not so big here. Here was worse, but still, this is significantly faster than using these polynomials. Uh, but what is far more interesting, yes? Okay. I'm just curious, like, what were the topics <coughs> that, that, that seem to be faster there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so I should also say, so these are the cheat schemes, and I'm going to explain why I call them cheat schemes for now. This is just uh, universal hashing and two independent hashing using multiplication shift methods, which are these extremely fast methods that were pioneered by Dietzfeldbinger, where basically this is the full code. A times X shifts some things. So basically, instead of doing A times X plus B mod P, you're instead using that you're just dealing with keys that are powers of two, and then you use that program language like C, throw away overflow for free, and then your div operation just becomes a shift. And that's why this kind of stuff is blistering fast. It's, if you just want universal low collision probability, you, the multiplier can be from the same domain as the key, which is, for 32-bit keys, really fast. Whereas for two independents, you need to have the multiplier be from a twice as big domain, 64 bits. So, well, I guess quadratic domain, which you can see gets much smaller, slower here. So that's a 64-bit multiplication here. That makes a difference on a 32-bit computer, but not on a 64-bit computer. So you can basically see how they use microcode to implement the 64-bit uh, multiplication with several 32-bit multiplications. Sorry, for, yeah. OK, I actually think, as I say, I actually also like sometimes implementing things as long as it's sort of a few lines of codes. I think it's pretty cool to see these kind of differences. OK. So, but I th what I think is far more interesting is this thing about what happens when you use the wrong hash function. So again, these were these functions we talked about when you just say a times x plus b. That are these schemes that you see here, where we just do a simple multiplication. So just the most classic hashing. And this is inside linear probing. So what I did was that I took a linear probing experiment. I did 100 experiments, and then I sorted them by how long time they took. OK, so I just did a lot of insertions and deletions. This is the average time per insertion or deletion. Right. And what you see is that it actually works extremely well with the cheat hashing schemes, those that do not have the right properties. But sometimes it goes bad, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And actually, the true average is logarithmic. So it's not constant as it should be. It's much worse than that. And then you can compare with that with the scheme for which we have some guarantees that they work. And you can say, even all these 100 experiments, you can hardly see a difference in speed. Right? These are ordered by how speed. And they're just completely as they should be. So these different schemes here, basically the red one is simple tabulation. And this is five independents using uh, the regular polynomials. And the reason why it's not 10 times faster this time is that this is in a real implementation with linear probing where the bottleneck is actually the indirect addressing when you look up the first thing in memory. So that's, we are adding up the cost. So that's probably most of the cost. And the cost we see from simple tabulation is just marginal compared with that. Okay. Well, actually, the real cost of the lookup is probably down here. 
whatever. But so the basic point is just that you have these simple schemes and hashing schemes that people often use in practice and they work terribly. So again, multiplicative hashing are used in practice if it, it turns out to be very unreliable. <coughs> and this is actually the example of typical denial of serverless attack because it's just based on consecutive IP addresses. And in fact, these arithmetic sequences is exactly what makes these systems break down. And they have excellent performance 95% of the time, but then they become systematically terrible. And it really has to do with the way they place things systematically. And these problems in randomized algorithms are really hard to detect for practitioners. For them, it's hard to know, are we unlucky, or is it because there's a systematic problem? And they're not even reproducible, right? Because as you can see again, if they tried, tested the system to try to see, was it, why did we go down? We have this denial of service attack. The whole system is in trouble, right? And then you test the hash table, and you run it. And then most likely, you get one of these nice experiments, the 95% experiments where things work perfectly. So you conclude, no, the hash table is fine, but it's not. So th this is really absolutely horrible what we're leaving to the practical world, not giving them proper hash functions. And so linear probing had gotten a reputation for being fastest in practice, but sometimes it's completely unreliable. And indeed at AT&T we had all kinds of workarounds, like if there were too many probes, we switched to a different system, which meant we had two systems to maintain and to debug and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so here we actually proved that linear probing is safe with good probabilistic performance for all inputs. Uh, so it is a powerful thing uh, that works for almost everything. But not certainly not everything because then it would be done and my research would be ended and stuff like that. I would have to <laughs> deal with graph problems or other difficult things. Um, so anyhow, with chaining and linear probing, each operation takes con expected constant time, but out of square root n operations, some of them are expected to take long time. And if you are a company like AT&T, each key represents a customer, and it's always the same customers that get into the large buckets, and just telling a fraction square root n of our customers, sorry, we don't want to deal with you because you go in the large buckets, it's just not very acceptable in the real world. So, but then comes the sort of savior. Well, if you had truly random hash function, it's easy to show that within every window of log login operations, the whole thing takes logarithmic time with high probability. So if we just had a small buffer, which we actually do in the internet routers, we'd get down to constant time preparation. And we can even also hide what goes on inside the system because we can just work in this window and we can process a packet in exactly the same constant time all the time. So from the outside perspective, it would look as if everything takes exactly the same time. Okay, so it's also good from a security perspective. The only problem is that simple tabulation doesn't do that. I can construct inputs for which uh, a logarithmic size window is expected to take log squared in time. But then comes a twist. So this is that you, I mean, the, yeah, unfortunately you got patent, but the patent lawyer was really excited why we called it twisted tabulation, but it actually has a, a nice, uh, a boring academic explanation. So basically the point is that we take the first C minus one characters and not only do we go to get a hash value out of them, we also get an extra twisted character out of it. And what we do with that is that we take that twister and, and XOR it with the last character before we look it up. So that's the only difference. So instead of just uh, getting hash values from the first C minus one characters, you get one extra character. You don't have any extra lookups, but you have a little bit more on your tables. And now everything works perfectly. And just from an implementation perspective, the twisting only results in these two extra statements in the C code. Otherwise, everything is exactly the same C that you would have run if you just did simple tabulation. So it's really not a lot. But it has many other nice applica applications. So actually, these, what I said before, were these horrible uh, channel bounds. Uh, I claim there's an improvement. So the point is that this plus, it used to be the number of bins to the minus gamma. But if you do something like throwing coins, then an unbiased coin, it just has m equal to 2. And doing m equal to 2 to the minus 5 is not very impressive. We don't want that. So instead, we can get the universe to the minus gamma. Okay, so, and that's typically 2 to the 64, and then you get whatever gamma you want to so the fifth, then you're really talking about a very small additive probability. So that's an effect of twisting, and, as, and, it, and it's really fundamental. So the basic point in it is, if we just get back to this thing, is this table will be fully used. As I said before, we risk the sort of worst case for simple tabulation is that you just have bit strings. So you have these nice big characters, 256 characters, but you never use more than 0 and 1. Then you use very little randomness in the system. 
But thanks to this thing, there will be at least one table where you fully use the randomness. And that's why we start getting a lot more power. And the same with minwise hashing. So again, the minwise hashing was that we wanted this fairness that each guy had the same chance of being smallest. And with simple tabulation, we, I claim we had small bias, but it sort of is and, some, and somehow not. Because if S is the size of the set we deal with, then it's 1 divided by S to 1 over C. That's great if S is large, but not if it's small. And again, with the twist, we sort of free ourselves for the combinatorial input that we're dealing with, and instead we get an, a bias which is 1 or U, the universe to 1 or C, which is then an absolute small bias instead of this thing that was only small if we dealt with large sets. And indeed, sometimes we want to deal with small sets. So in both cases, with the channel bounds, we had the problems that if we just had two different values, like when we throw coins, uh, or here when we're dealing with small sets, then we really need the twisting for things to work out. This is also my student, John Dalgo, was part of uh, doing this. And just to see what happens, it makes things a little bit slower, but not by much. Another interesting thing is it works really well as a pseudo-random number generator. So what happens is when you want to run these tabulation schemes for pseudo-random number generator, the only thing that ever changes is the least character. And if we work with a twisted least character, I can twist any character I want. There's really only one table you need to look up in every time. And that's why the random pseudo number generator is twice as fast as the hashing thing. And it's six times faster than random from the C library. And this is this standard pseudo random number generator that actually performs really badly. Here we're guaranteed that we can work things with Chernoff bounds and we can use them for statistics, numerical integration, or anything you want. Uh, because you actually do have these chain of bounds that we use all the time when we analyze things. So, so we can do a lot with simple tabulation and twisted tabulation, but suppose you really, really, that you're a very traditional person and still want high independence. And there's actually a few applications of that still. Then uh, all you have to do is to apply it twice. And again, log n independence, there's many cases where this is really the only way we know how to prove that things work. And also, with minwise hashing and Chernoff bounds, the error that we have falls exponentially in independence. So if you can get a really large independence, you get much better bounds than those we had before. And so again, just recalling what independence is, the standard way of doing it is just using these polynomials. And it's really a deal when it comes to space and amount of randomness, because we only have to store k random elements from uh, the field we are dealing with. But the problem is that we, to evaluate the hash, we actually have to look up all these k coefficients, and that takes order k time. And this is sort of, it's very different from the tabulation-based thing, where we store lots of randomness, but when we look things up, we only look up a few things. And Siegel did some beautiful studies about that, where he showed that, uh, so suppose we want k-independent hashing and want to use strictly less than k-time. And, and I'm talking about a more combinatorial. I'm only looking at how many times do you look up something in memory. So I assume that each memory cell has room for only one, basically what corresponds to one hash value. And now the question is, can we look up less than k things? So we could look up the k coefficient, but is it possible to look up less? And the answer is negative. Just if you're only allowed to do k minus one probes, then your space explodes, then you need u to the 1 over t space. And that's exactly the kind of space we use with these tabulation-based techniques. And on the positive side, he proved that you can get this kind of u to the omega 1 over c squared. I know it looks horrible, especially if large constants are hidden, in c to the c time using u to the 1 over c space. So if you want to formulate it as matching up on lower bounds, then you just say that to get uh, super constant independence and constant time, you need some polynomial of the universe space. And you can indeed get that. You can get even uh, a polynomial in U independence and constant time using that space. Okay, so everything matches nicely. And this is clearly better than the, independ that the log independence you needed for most applications. And it, if you look at Chernoff bounds and minwise hashing, you would get this kind of bias, which is really small. But as he points out, it's far too slow for any practical application. So the new thing we had was uh, that with double tabulation, you actually get the same independence, but only spending order C time, which is the best you could hope for that matches this bound here. 
And the, the scheme is very simple and easy to implement, but the analysis is not. And we have done something more elaborate where we get high independence, but using a little bit longer time. And so this is again using this simple tabulation, which was not only for independent. But what we claim is that simple tabulation is expected to yield very fast, unbalanced, constant degree expanders. And if we apply it twice, we get highly independent hashing. And the two things are very related. So how can I view such a hash function or any fa function as an expander? So I just think of a function that takes my keys and map it over to D characters. And I claim that defines a, a natural unbalanced expander because we basically say we get D different characters and each of them we, we view as just being on the right hand side in this uh, bipartite graph. So on the one side we have the universe and on the right side we have characters together with their position, so output position characters. Okay. So again, these are the neighbors of the key X. So now we have to find a graph, and we want to claim that this is an expander. And, the, and, the, and, and that is the clay case that we proved that with a reasonable probability, if you use 12 times as many output characters as input characters, then we have this property that if you look at a set that's not too large, then its neighborhood is at least D half times bigger which is a classic definition of an expander. Okay. But the point is that uh, we don't have any un explicit unbalanced expanders that are remotely as good. I mean, those here, they have logarithmic degrees and would be orders of magnitude slower to compute. So this is a very sort of, uh, we know simple tabulation is extremely fast, so this gives us a very implementable expander. But again, it's not explicit. It would be explicit if I could actually find it doesn't have to be, I'm saying a random simple tabulation function works. There could be an explicit construction of this tabulation function. I mean, an explicit way of filling out the table that would make this thing work. And then you would have an extremely efficient explain, expander to use. But I don't know how to do that. I think that's a beautiful problem. So actually what we need to get high independence is just a weaker notion of an expander, which is that whenever you look at a set that's not too large, there's some key that has a unique output character that is not shared by everybody else, right? These are the output characters. There's multiple keys that get to them, but this output character is only one that X has. And so you get that kind of unique neighbor expander if, you have, if your neighborhood is bigger than uh, half times your degree times your size. Uh, but you actually get some better bounds. You only need six times as many output characters as uh, input characters to get these kind of unique expanders. And that's all you need for high independence. Uh, so again, we can prove that we get uh, this unique expander. And then Siegel has this idea that's part of his approach, that if you have one of these k-unique functions and you plug them together with simple tabulation, then you get something that's k-independent. And that's very easy to see. So what's the idea? We have first, we map our keys into these output position characters, each key gets d different characters over here. And then we associate with each output position character a random value, and we just x all these. OK, so the point is that x is the only one who has this output position character. So it's the only one that gets the hash value, the random hash value associated with this output position character. So again, it comes down here. So that means that the hash of x is totally independent of the hash of the rest of the set. And now we just peel X away, and now we are guaranteed that there's a new key that has a unique output character that gives us a hash value that makes its hash value independent of the rest. Okay, so it's very simple, the connection between unique expanders, unique neighbor expander, and the simple tabulation. So again, the corollary is just, if you really want high independence, then all you have to do is to apply simple tabulation twice. You have to make sure that in this intermediate domain, uh, you use six times as many characters in that, as in your first domain. And again, this first unique thing, you only have to guess one of them. You don't need many of them. And so the constants may look horrible, but they're not that bad. So, I, so not using the formulas because to make them nice, I had to, well, hide a lot of constants and stuff like that. But to really compute the exact constants, I found that for 32-bit keys divided into two characters each, so that's 2 to the 16 uh, different characters, uh, we actually do get a 100 unique function with probability 1 minus 1.5 times 10 to the minus 42. 
Okay, so that's pretty small error probability. So it's probably going to be the safest part of your hardware if you just have a USB flash drive with random bits in your claim. Here is a un universal k-unique simple hash function. That's a very safe claim to make. Okay, uh, so 100 independent hashing is thus possible and at least it's easy to implement. But I still want to say that simple and twisted tabulation is going to be a lot faster because you see in the intermediate domain we actually have 20 characters to look up where we, if we just had simple tabulation directly, we only had to look up two things. So it is going to be significantly slower. So in the same way as we normally prefer to use two independents rather than 20 independents, we also prefer to use simple tabulation by the same order of magnitude uh, over uh, uh, double tabulation. And also there's an issue with space. We need far more tables, so the chance that we can stay in cache is much smaller. So that's why I say 10 to 100 times faster and not just 10 times faster. So just in lookups, it's 10 times faster, but including the space is probably much worse. So open problem on uh, the K independence. So again, we had this beautiful negative result of Siegel. The new positive results are here where either we sort of sacrifice that the independence is not as good as it is down here, or we down here spend too much time where this is the optimal thing relative to Siegel's bounds. And what, we really, what I really would like to see was if it's possible to get U to the omega 1 over C independence in the optimal time using optimal space. And for all that I know, I still believe that double tabulation is doing that directly. I just don't know how to prove it. But let's go even further. What if you really don't want any notion of anything, you just want fully random hashing? Okay. So that's, of course, the ideal thing. So it turns out that we can do that for any given set S using, with high probability uh, using only linear space. And that was already proved by pay and pay, but we now get a really simple version of it. We use double tabulation again. So the requirement is just that the size of the set you look at is, well, it actually just has to be uh, 0.9 times 5, but let me just say the size of the alphabet divided by 2. Right, so the randomness in the system is the size of the alphabet. So if you want full randomness, you clearly can't deal with a set that's bigger than that. But if you deal with a set that's just half of that or less, then with high probability, you get full randomness on the set. So for many applications, you just have to be lucky that you get this uh, full randomness, and then you can just forget everything about restrictions. So just to compare with the theorem we had before, some, some very nice things happened here, right? Because before when we want high independence, we needed six times as many characters, output characters as input characters. Here we need four, independent on how many input characters there were. So this gives a much more efficient scheme. Okay, so even if you have 20 input characters, you still only need two, four characters in output. And the other difference is again that here we had, what we had here was independence which says that for every single set, subset of the universe that had less characters than this, uh, list keys than that, we had full independence. This statement is, is very different. It's for a much larger set, but on the other hand, it's only with high probability for that given set. And I just want to say the previous fully random hashing actually uses this thing as a subroutine, which means it had to deal with these six times more characters and stuff like that. So uh, now we just see that we get this fully random hashing directly with double tabulation without having to go through this construction here. Okay. So at least now fully random hashing, if you're willing to spend as much space as the size of the set, you can get it with high probability with a trivial algorithm. Okay, so this should be very useful in algorithm design. And also just to, I know I'm almost out of time, but I want to, I claimed something abstract, I wanted to take away, but then I thought, okay, I'll try to put it back. I'm going, I need one more slide. Okay, so the, what's really going on here again is, is the same uniqueness as before. What we show is that if you have this hash function, which is random simple tabulation, and if you're dealing with a set which is less than half the alphabet size, then with this low probability here, or with this high probability, uh, every subset of the set has a unique output character. Okay, so again, it's pretty much the same statement ha as we had before where you can use peeling, and again, we now have that the probability that things go wrong is phi to the d half rounded down, and that's how I got the d equal to 4 here, because then it's, uh, uh, well, 2 here. Okay. Um, I think I made a little misstatement, but it's basically the thing. So 
how to, I, one of the things I claimed in the abstract was that if we had two large sets, we had a simple way of, this, if they're very similar, we have a simple way of finding out exactly what the difference is. So I'm just looking at weighted sets that I think of as a vector over set U, where the support, that is the number of non-zero elements, are S. So that's a different way of talking about a weighted set, but it's more easy when we want to talk about uh, vectors and stuff like that. And I want the linear sketch of the set, which has only order N size, so that if S is smaller than that, I can recover S directly from this linear sketch. So this is these invertible bloom filters of Goldreich and Mitzmacher. I think they're extremely cute. Uh, and what's the application of this? That is that if you're given two, the linear sketch of two sets, and if the difference is small, then you can recover the difference just by subtracting the linear sketch of one from the other. <coughs> Okay, so we have this similarity estimation before, which is about telling about how similar are things, how much are they different, and stuff like that. And if things are really similar, then we can even tell exactly what the difference is. You have these huge sets, you just get this little bit of information from each of it, then you combine it, and now you can just say exactly what are the elements in which it differ. Or the other example is you have all these people who enter uh, a cinema and they try to run out and you want to see if anybody has left, and you just have this little sketch that you can track on, and then you can say, oh, Carl and Peter are still here, just by looking at that little bit of information, even though thousands of people came in and left. It was not a reference to Paris or anything like that. Um, so I just want to, so to make this work, all you really need is just to make sure that the keys are identifiable. So you add some signature of some kind so you can easily give in an element from sort of an even bigger universe, see if it's a possible key. And then you use this random simple tabulation from before, and you can see the picture looks like, very much like the proof with uh, Siegel's peeling. But now what you do is for every single key, you add its name to all its neighbors. So X had a unique neighbor, so when I added its name to all its neighbors and I did that for every key, it still only says X here, so I can still see it says X. With other ones, it's complete garbage what's there because I added up all kinds of keys. But there's one, there's a, I'm guaranteed that there's one key I can just look at and see here it is. Then I can pull him out from the scratch, and now I'm again guaranteed that there's a key that's alone and hence where I can see what's going on. I pull it out, oh yeah, well I, I didn't have time to write more slides, but the basic point is just I can completely recover them just because there will always be some information that's not garbage where I can see what the element is, pull him out, and continue. Okay, so this is sort of the formal way of doing the same thing. Okay. So as you can see, I've had a lot of fun with this kind of tabulation because it actually seems like a lot of these things we like to do with hashing is possible using this tabulation. Uh, and I say it offers much of the power of idealistic fully random hashing, and we even get that with high probability. And, and it's really uh, simple to use, and, uh, and it's blistering fast. Uh, it contrasts classic polynomial hashing, where we can have lots of randomness, because we can have lots of randomness in the tables, but the whole point is that only little is used in each hash computation. That's a general idea why you have tables in general. You don't want to do all the computations. It takes a lot of computation to put into the tables, but when first it's there, when you want to compute a new value, you don't have to look, make too many lookups. And one of the nice things is that for these tables, we only need a pointer to some randomly configured memory without any special structure. So this could just be really cheap, fast read-only memory. You don't even need to change it or anything like that. So somebody just gives you a bunch of random bits in a space, and you can just use it. You just need a pointer to them. That's it. Uh, and that's also really good for multi-core systems and stuff like that, because when we do read-only, it leaves the cache clean, everybody can work on it in parallel, it's very easy. So you can imagine some huge tables, which would mean that even 32-bit characters may be very easy to uh, support. Okay, and then we are talking about maybe two logups or something like that, and then it gets even faster. And you can also do limited randomness because you can really just think of it as a pre-processing step. So if you, your application is something that only log, needs log n independence, and if tabulation works, then it also works if you just use log n independent pseudo-random number generator to fill in the tables. Okay, so it's not like that I with tabulation say you need more randomness than you needed before. It's just the space that gets into account, gets used. Right, I, I, I use it to pre-compute the tables, and now everything is fast. Uh, so again, there's a generic open problem that says that because it's so fast and easy to implement, uh, uh, you should just take anything you do with hashing, and then this might actually be a way of making it really happen, in the sense that you may be able to prove that tabulation works. It's often, it's, the proofs can be fairly complicated, at least that's my experience, at least for me they can be fairly complicated, uh, but it's worth it in the sense that, well, for two reasons, right? So one thing is, 
instead of trying to do a new hash function to every single application you have in mind and then tell people what it is, if we can just prove that the same hash function uses for all these different things, then it's kind of also proving some more general power, right? Because you really expect it to just be points, and really the hash function is working for the convex hull of all these points, right? You know it works here, you know it works here. It probably also works all kind of places in the middle, right? So it's much more appealing than having a different hash function for every single application. So that's one big advantage for this program. It's really, you can just tell people, yeah, simple tabulation works for that as well. Right, so instead of this thing with the guy from Dr. Dobbs that says, I really like this hash function, it seems to work, here we actually can sort of make proofs that it works for other applications. Uh, and also, and, and just sort of in that line, recently with uh, my students, uh, at least some of them, I showed that simple tabulation gives the power of choices and load balancing. Some of you may know what it is, some of you are not, but the basic thing is we had these things with uh, throwing balls into bins and we got up to log and divided by log, log n in one of the bins, but you can get down to log log just using a power of choice where every time you want to throw a bin, uh, a ball, you get two bins to choose from and you put it in the smaller. So that thing works almost perfectly with a uh, simple tabulation. There's a minor difference. You only get the same expected bound as the worst case, but then you get it within a constant factor. Anyway. Anyhow, just to say there are all kinds of places where it seems to be useful. And one of my uh, the problems I really like here is that we're really close to match Siegel's bound. I would like to understand this whole, po I mean, I first ditched high independence, but I somehow still like it anyway. And I would really like to know, is it possible to get U to 1 over C independence in order C time using U to 1 over C space? Right, so and I think we are getting very close. I can get it within a log factor in the time, and I think it's time to close that problem. Uh, and a wild conjecture is that double tabulation achieves this. Okay, I just don't want my favorite tool to be used to doing it. But it's okay if you can do it in other ways. Okay, so that's really it. Time for a few questions. So it seems that double tabulation is the way to go. Uh, yeah, but that was 20 t 10 to 100 times more expensive, so I would much rather use simple tabulation if I can. Yeah. Well, yeah, if you just want the full randomness with high probabilities, then that's also, then it's a very good way to go. But if you wanted this thing with uh, many lookups, it's a little too expensive. <laughs>